What is archaeometry? Well, archaeometry, I think I've already touched upon it, it's, it's a very advanced branch of black magic and voodoo, which involves uh, cultivating the ability to enter into alternate universes. And then you go into these universes and you, um, you try and, and basically energize the universe, become the god of that universe, and then draw power from that universe back into your own universe. Uh, this started out basically as part of the, the worship of the star god Sirius, which is known in Egypt as Set, which is the, he's like the Egyptian version of the devil. And the idea was you had, because there was a black um, dwarf star of Sirius next to the white star Sirius, became known as Sirius A and Sirius B. And ancient magicians realized that they could use that black star as a gateway into an alternate universe. And so that's how they discovered Universe B. And then later on there was Universe C and D and E and et cetera, et cetera. And, and who knows now how many of these universes have been, so to speak, discovered. So that's the essence of it. What is its power? Well, it, it, first of all, it's a very advanced kind of magic which very few people can do. But if they can do it, it's, it's a very, uh, I mean, and again, I don't know even, you know, that's the trouble with this sort of thing. You don't know how much of this is even demonic delusion. I mean, do you really go into another dimension? Do you really go through this, like, dimensional gate? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But whatever it is, the person who comes back invariably seems to have amped up their power by a whole order of magnitude. So it's like squared, if you will, or something. So it is apparently a very potent way of augmenting your, your magical power. And, and it's believed by these people this is a very easy way of becoming a living god. Okay, and is there a downside to it? Well, yes, because whether or not this stuff is, is, is really based on a genuine thing of, of physics or whatever, the fact of the matter is, is you're doing it by demonic power. And if you're indeed entering other universes, those are universes that are populated by extremely evil beings and extremely wise, cruel beings. And they're going to take advantage of you. They might not, you might not originally perceive that, but ultimately they're going to, you know, they're going to use you for their own purposes and then spit you out like, you know, so much used chewing tobacco and that will be the end of you. So uh, I know I, I just had begun to work in this um, and, and it was a very terrifying experience to go through that dimensional doorway and uh, I really, you know, thankfully I kind of was drawn back out of it partly by my wife and partly by the almighty Yahweh before I could get too badly burnt by it. 
Do you know of any connections between Walt Disney and the dark side? Well, there again, that's a real um, mind-blowing question because most people think of Walt Disney and oh, you know, happy little cartoons, family amusement park. But actually, from the very beginning, Walt Disney was funded by the people of the black nobility, the Venetian black nobility, and uh, and a lot of his basically he was set up to essentially rewrite the fairy tales of Western Europe and make them less Christian and more occultic. And um, really, if you look at the, the fruit, if you will, of the Disney empire, and both in both Disneyland and Disney World and the other places, uh, all of this stuff is very heavily rooted in the occult. Um, the other problem with it is, is that, is that there's very reliable reports that in the in the 30s Disney was using drugs. He was involved with very powerful psychedelic drugs, which of course can open the door to the demonic realm. And that's why there's a lot of subtle things in his movies that point kids toward drug addiction. And I met better people than I have done have done very careful commentaries on the Disney, especially the cartoons, and how each and every cartoon draws kids subtly into more and more occult stuff, and it's getting more and more obvious. Originally it was very subtle, but I can even remember, my favorite Disney film was uh, Fantasia. And uh, and there's so much occult stuff in there, and not just in The Sorcerer's Apprentice, and not just in the Night on Bald Mountain segments. And uh, part of that movie was what, just over the years of, of watching it whenever I could, because of course this is before there were video cassettes, um, I just got enthralled with that, and, and I ended up, I think that's maybe 10 or 15% of the reason, just that single movie, why I got into the occult. So it's, it's, a, it's a really disturbing thing, and especially when you consider that so many thousands and thousands of parents just sort of surrender their kids to the Disney empire, you know, whether they take them to the amusement parks, or whether they, you know, let them watch videos and use the videos as kind of babysitters, you know, it's, it's not a good thing. Thank you. Have you ever had any contacts from people who really know what's going on with Disney about what they're planning? Well, we, we've had two or three people at least over the years um, who were uh, who had said that they're, they're, especially at Disneyland, that children were actually being briefly kidnapped and mind control and given like, you know, uh, mind control things and then somehow plunked back in their parents' custody before their parents got too alarmed. Um, and also, you know, the the whole thing like the movie Pinocchio, uh, which of course is one of Disney's most famous films, has this whole segment in it about the lost boys who um, go onto this island of where everything is wonderful. And that's like a that's like a metaphor for Disneyland. And of course, little Pinocchio is going along with them, and they get to do everything they want. They get to play pool and smoke cigars, and and yet as they do, they start turning into jackasses. You know, their ears start growing and everything. And this, not Disney made this up. I mean, this is part of the the story originally. But but the metaphor is, is that of course is that the jackass is a symbol in the Bible of the unsaved, unregenerate person. And it's like Disneyland and Disney World and all the Disney products are scientifically designed to bring out that part of a child to bring out the unregenerate, untamed, savage nature of them. And when you add that to the fact that at least, you know, some kids are actually being spirited off and 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 somehow are ritualized or mind controlled is is very, very disturbing. When you say they're scientifically designed, what do you mean by that? Well I mean, you know, the the all of the different um, first of all of course the parks teach evolution. Uh, second of all, a lot of the stuff in the rides and whatever is is designed to just evoke that part of a child's personality. Uh, and in, in terms of the movies and everything, uh, the the videos there they all are are they they teach values which are subtly anti-Christian, and thereby the you know they're doing things they're teaching the kids values that will cause them to move in the direction of being, if you will, uh, wild donkeys instead of being good little Christian boys and girls. Now, maybe I, the use of the word scientific is a little bit extreme, but but still, you know, I mean, it, uh, I read, you know, like there are people on the web, like there are very serious Christian researchers that are just line upon line of dissected movies like The Little Mermaid and The Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King and, you know, all of the, the Black Cauldron, 
all of these classic Disney cartoons are just full of this stuff. And 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 if a child is exposed to it without the parents sitting there and saying, "Oh well, you know that's not really true or that's not right or whatever," then then you know they're going to end up being a little pagan before they're ten years old. Okay, thank you. Please tell us a story about the child that came to you who was having problems um, since the child, the parents had taken them to Disneyland. Well, yeah, this one little boy was brought to us by his folks when we were we were ministering in deliverance and. Um, and he, they'd taken him to Disneyland because they were, they were up in the, we were all up in the Pacific Northwest and so it was closer for them. And essentially, um, the child was, uh, started having all of these acting out episodes after going to Disneyland, even though he told everybody he loved it, you know. But he had all these, you know, bizarre dreams and he would talk about, oh, being in the red room and being in the blue room and being made to, to do icky things and stuff like that. And it was all coming out in nightmares. And, and they just, they said, well, it sounds like this is some sort of weird kind of satanic thing or other. And so we, uh, you know, we did some uh, ministry on him and, and we had him sit down and like draw, because he was, I forget, I think it was like maybe five or six years old at the time. And we had to like draw pictures and it turned out that he was led through a, it's so strange, a maze that perfectly mimicked the fallen tree, the clephotic tree of the of the back, what's called the night side of Eden, the clephotic tree of life, and that all the colors matched and everything, and they were leading him through these things, and he was describing things that a five-year-old child, whatever age he was, would have no way of knowing about the back side of the tree, the, the tunnels of Typhon and everything, and he was describing people, you know, like putting things in his, you know, private areas and all this would, would lead me to believe. And this, we don't, you see, we were very careful not to ever lead the kids and say, oh, well, did someone do something to you? Did someone put something there? And, and you know, we just asked, well, what happened? And that's, that's what he said he was remembering. The more we prayed, the more we asked the spirits that were preventing him, because they always, of course, give these kids, you know, suggestions, oh, you won't remember, you know, don't remember this or we'll kill your parents or something like that, you know. So there's a certain demonic wall you have to break through. But but we did, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and then the child was remembering some of these sexual things that were done to him. And this was all done in the context of some place in Disneyland. And he'd actually gone missing from yes. a ride, hadn't he? He had gone missing from a ride, and at first, you know, the parents were just a little worried, but it, it took about, you know, an hour or so, and then he turned up, and he seemed to be fine. And, of course, they called the um, of course they have they have Disney security there and everything and they 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 found him and nothing seemed to be the matter but then later on all these things started happening so uh, I don't know I mean it, it's really sad when something like that which is basically a national monument to childhood and it's being used for evil purposes but I really think that's what's going on is there anything more you can say about this whole Disney thing well, a lot of the, um, the inf people might say, well, where do you get all this information about the, the background of Disney himself? And a lot of it was did some really groundbreaking research that was done uh, by an acquaintance of mine who was a very serious scholar. And he just, he just made a point to really dig into this. And uh, he has done an amazing amount of work. Uh, his name is Anton Chaikin. And uh, he really um, is the one who dug up a lot of stuff about the early, early, um, Disney years in the 30s and 40s and how he came to be under the under the patronage if you will of these various dark forces and you know uh, he tells a story at one point of how he was making Snow White which is his first major animated feature length cartoon and someone said well that's not the story of, of Snow White and he said when I get done with kids they won't care what the real story of Snow White is you know like I'm gonna change fairy tales that, that so that people will not even recognize them anymore and that's basically what he did and I mean you know I, I don't know if this fellow has actually put his stuff into print but I do know it was copiously footnoted the manuscript and stuff that I, I was able to see and it fits with as I said the personal experiences I have and then of course the other thing is is that you know it's obvious Disney is not very family friendly quote unquote when they're having this big gay appreciation day down there and, and having all sorts of ungodly things go on and inviting you know every homosexual of the sun uh, down to Disney World to, to celebrate and to do whatever ungodly things they might be doing so it's really I mean if I had a child I would not let him anywhere near anything by Disney or let him near any of the theme parks 
What is a vampire? Well, um, a vampire, let me give you the classical definition and then I'll give you the real definition. I mean, classically a vampire is, is a, a walking corpse that uh, sleeps by day in the coffin or some other secluded place out of the sunlight and then rises and at night it subsists by drinking the blood of the living. And this is an almost universal legend in just about every culture on earth from from China to Greece to even, you know, South and North American Indians um, have some version of this. Now, what the reality of it is, is that a vampire is a member of, a, of an actual cult. There is a, a vampire cultus that, that basically initiates people just like you might be initiated as a Freemason or something. And, and these people believe, after going through certain initiatic things and, and drinking of blood and whatever, they believe that, that they will acquire supernatural powers and that upon their death, that three days later, they will rise as an animated corpse and a full-blown vampire. And um, there's certain things that vampires can do and certain things vampires cannot do. For example, vampires do not like the sunlight. They cannot really deal well with the sunlight. Uh, they don't like garlic because garlic's a blood purifier. Um, and of course, they don't like Christian religious symbols. Um, on the other hand, they're able to, they, they some of the things that are like Hollywood, you know, I've never seen a vampire turn into a bat. I've never seen them turn into a mist or, you know, float under a door or turn into a swarm of rats like you read about in the book Dracula. But um, they do seem to have some control over the elements. Uh, and they do, they do actually grow fangs, and they, they use those fangs to drink the blood of the living. Um, I guess that's as good a start as any, we can certainly elaborate on that. Wow, thank you. Okay. How and why did you become a vampire? A very good question. A lot of people ask me that. Well, see, again, I was on this path of Satanism, and at one point, in order to proceed, you, you have to cross the abyss, as it's called, and then at that point you, you make a choice. And there may be different choices in different parts of the world, but where I was, uh, I was told I would have to be, either become a werewolf or become a vampire. And I knew a couple of people that were, that were shapeshifters, that were were people, you know, and they said, you know, well, it's real painful. And I thought, well, I'm not really into pain, you know, and the whole vampire thing sounded kind of sexy and erotic and whatever. So I thought, well, okay, we'll do it that way. And Because it was like a choice. It's either this or that, or else you just sit there and on your hands and don't grow anymore as a great black magician. So that was why I did it. Thank you. For how long were you a vampire? Well, I think it was probably at least two years, somewhere in there. Thanks. So what's the difference between a real vampire and a wannabe vampire? Well, that's the thing. Nowadays, the, the, especially, it seems like with the advent of the, the Anne Rice books and, the, and like the movie Interview with a Vampire and some similar movies, uh, the, the kids, young people that have come along, they, that's part of kind of a subdivision of the goth scene, they want to be vampires. And the difference is primarily is that they, they sort of play at it. Either they, they dress like them and they put on white makeup and maybe they even get these contact lenses that you put, you know, I, I've seen them in optical stores, you can buy them for like 69 bucks and they, they make your eyes look like serpent eyes or bloodshot or like an eyes of Dracula, you know, and they, they walk around and they, they're actually, are, in most large cities, there are vampire nightclubs, uh, there are, you know, places where you can go, either those are goth clubs and, and do your vampire thing. And some of them will actually drink blood, but they'll do it, you know, in a much more, you know, kind of tacky way out of they'll, they'll have razor blades and they'll cut someone's wrist and drink a little blood and they claim this is the most intimate form of sexuality because it's an exchanging of energies and that much is true. But of course, you know, Yahweh, God, forbids us from drinking blood. But the difference is, is that the real, the real one, like I was, let me, let me be clear, I was kind of like a vampire, a first degree vampire. I had not yet died. The belief is, obviously I don't want to be here talking about it, but uh, the belief is is that the first level of being a vampire, um, you, you are still a living human being, and then when you die, then you become a full-blown vampire. 
And um, so at the level I was at, I didn't need a razor blade to drink blood. And from what I understand, uh, these wannabe vampires, they, they do eat. They eat food, you know, they, they do drink blood, but they also eat more or less normal food. All they tend to eat a lot of stuff like raw meat and bloody stuff and things like that, but they, they do consume food. I couldn't eat. Once I made the transition into being a vampire initiate, I couldn't, if I tried to eat anything, I would throw it up. If I even tried to drink water, I would throw it up. The only things that I could eat were human blood and Roman Catholic communion. How did you feel about that? Well, it was it got rather monotonous after a while. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, the, there's a rush to drinking blood, which is quite. I mean, blood is really one of the ultimate addictive things. There is actually a psychological uh, identification of of there are people who are addicted to drinking blood, just like there are people who are addicted to drugs or to you know other weird things. Um, but it was it was very in, in spite of that. I mean, yeah, you have this momentary rush from drinking the blood or whatever, but then you have, you know, like eight or nine hours in a day where you're thinking, boy, I wish I had a pizza, you know, boy, I wish I had a hamburger, you know. <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds kind of mundane and silly, but yet, and I knew, you know, it was just like, if I ate these things, I would just throw them up. And, um, but on the other hand, I, you know, I could very easily survive by by drinking the blood of some of the people in our covens, and then also by, you know, I was a, celebrating Catholic Mass every day and, and consuming that, and that, that seemed to hold me. But it, it, it was very monotonous. Mm, thank you. You said they changed their eyes. Were your eyes different? Other than the fact that I had, I, for that period, I had extremely good night vision. No, that's kind of a Hollywood thing. Uh, I, the, the person that I met, two or three real vampires that I'm, including the person that initiated me, and none of them had weird looking eyes. But a real vampire, their skin, and this is something, I mean, I know for a fact that, that Anne Rice um, wrote the novel, Interview with a Vampire, among many others. She has obviously been in contact with real vampires because their skin, and even my skin was like this, it gets, it gets this kind of beautiful, translucent, glowing quality. It's like you can almost see the veins like stained glass. Through their through their skin, like on their face and on their hands, um, but uh, I'm sorry, I forgot where I was going. With what your eyes look like? Oh no, my eyes look reasonably normal, other than the fact that they would they would just totally expand, like at night. I mean, I could I could see in total darkness, which was good because I was sleeping in a coffin, which was totally dark. I mean, there's no light inside of a coffin. Wow. When you said that Catholic communion kept you alive, what did you mean by that? Well, see, in the Catholic faith, um, it is doctrine that in the wafer or in the blood and the cup of wine, that that contains the entire body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. So in my case, because I was a priest, I got to drink both from the cup and then eat the wafer. But it wouldn't have mattered. Either way, I was actually consuming an entire body of a human adult 33-year-old male, according to Catholic doctrine. So the idea is that was enough blood, quote-unquote, to keep me alive. Now, just let's back off from this one step and think, how strange is this that, you know, there's enough demonic power in Roman Catholic communion to keep a vampire alive? I mean, the implications, I would think, for the average Catholic who's you know, going to communion every Sunday should be rather staggering, I would think. Um, because this, this, you know, I, was, I was this vampire who had you know, totally given himself over to the devil, and I was celebrating Catholic Mass every day. So in a whole day, say, how many wafers could you, could you live off? One. You could live a whole well, day off one little wafer, which is probably usually, half a calorie. Yeah, plus the wine. And how many, you could go forever on just one way for a day? No. You needed the wine as well? I needed the blood. Right. Human okay. blood. R right, and how often would you need the human blood? Oh, every other day or so. Mm -hmm. But the need grew. See, like any addiction, you keep needing a little more and a little more and a little more. So at first, you know, maybe twice a week was enough. 
then three times a week was what I needed, in addition to doing this Mass every day. And then finally it was like every day, and then it started getting really intense. Okay, now you say your teeth grew canines. Can you explain that whole process? I mean, right now your teeth couldn't no. get into someone's no. neck. Well, no. Well, I could, but I have to do it in a funny way. Uh, actually, what happens is it's almost like, without being vulgar, it's almost like the human sexual response. When even a first level vampire is hungry and they're in the immediate presence of food, there's an arousal that takes place. Uh, except the arousal takes place here rather than down there. That's about the most delicate way I can put it. And, and so your teeth grow about a half inch longer and very sharp. And, and plus your mouth, you start salivating this very thick saliva, which is full of cocaine. And wow. cocaine is a topical anesthetic. And so when you like go up to the person, in my case I always use, always use women, you like lick them a few times, which is of course kind of erotic, and then you, you know, that numbs the flesh. And then you chomp away and drink the blood. And then that same saliva acts as a quick healer. There's something in it. And you might, people might think, well, this is so bizarre. You know, how could this be true? Well, the funny thing is, is during this period, <laughs> it sounds funny, vampire going to the dentist, but I, I had a friend who was a, at Marquette Dental School, and he kind of arm wrestled me into going to the dental school to get some dental work done because I didn't have a lot of money. And I went in there, and he started working on me. And this was before dentists typically used rubber gloves because it was pre-AIDS and everything. And he started working on me, and he says, you've got the thickest, strangest saliva I've ever seen. You know, and this guy was a fourth-year dental, uh, dental student, you know, so he'd seen a lot of mouths. And all of a sudden, he started dropping everything. And he says, my fingers are getting numb. <gasps> and he couldn't figure out why this was. And he says, it's like someone put Novocaine on my fingers. And so he had to back off and sit there for like 10 or 15 minutes. And then he put on, you know, the typical rubber gloves. And then he finished working on my teeth. Wow. So, so there is something, you know, because uh, I don't know if people know this, but, but all the different things, the procaine, Novocaine, that are used by dentists are actually all chemical analogy analogs of, of the original cocaine. Wow. So. What, what kind of appetite did you have? Well, you mean for blood? Well, for everything. Well, I, I had an appetite for the usual things people have appetites for, but I, I mean, if I actually put something in my mouth, it would just make me nauseous. So I was more or less forced to not be able to eat anything except blood. But I would, I would, get very, I would wake up in the morning and the night, you know, because I'd sleep all day, and I'd be pretty darn hungry. And there's not a cup and, of blood in the fridge, is there? Well, not usually, no. Uh, but what I would do is I would get up and right away I would celebrate a mass. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, which is unusual because you're not normally supposed to say, except on rare occasions, a Catholic mass after sunset. But this was, this was obviously a special circumstance. <laughs> and, uh, and then typically uh, one of the girls that was in the coven with us would drop by and I'd, you know, bite her neck. Thank you. So what did you have to actually do to become a vampire? Well, that's a pretty long process, but you begin with, you start taking certain specialized herbs, which I'm not going to name because I don't want anybody messing with this, and also large doses of B vitamins, oddly enough. And plus you start cultivating as a meditative practice the idea of being what's called a psychic vampire you start learning how to suck energy out of people. And this went on for a few months, uh, and, and I got real good at that. I mean, Did people get pretty tired around you? If I, if I, you know, I was, you know, I was, I was a very well-mannered vampire. I never, I usually sucked it out of strangers. Like I'd sit on a bus or something and I'd sit there and I, I could actually draw energy out of people that were sitting around me, standing around me, whatever. And, uh, and at that time, I was given uh, a special ring which would facilitate that process. It was a special onyx ring, very large uh, black stone that I could sort of use as a focal point for my meditative practice when I was away from my house. Then uh, the next stage was 
I was starting, I was given increasing doses of cocaine. And cocaine, as you know, is very addictive. Uh, and it's also rather dangerous. You can very easily take so much you get tachycardia or even give yourself a stroke or a heart attack. But very quickly, because of the previous things I'd taken, I worked myself to where I was taking rather large amounts of cocaine. And this again over a period of weeks. And plus I started doing a special, what's called a special nosferatic mass. See the word nosferatu is um, Romanian, I think, for undead. And um, so we, we referred to this whole current as the Nosferatic current of magic. When you say current, we mean like a, a sort of a line of power. And um, like there would be a Wiccan current, or there'd be a Voodoo current, or a Crowley current. Well, this was the Nosferatic current. And this, this actually involved calling, instead of like doing a mass where you, you know, in the Catholic theology, supposedly you draw in Jesus Christ into the bread and wine, well, this was a mass where you drew in the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Vlad Tepesh, who was the real person who was upon which the Dracula novel was based. He was actually a 15th century Wallachian nobleman, and, uh, which is part of Transylvania, you know, the old, this is Transylvania, <laughs> that kind of thing. So we would do this mass, and then I would consume the sacramental elements, and that would start to transform me from within. And so I could take increasing amounts of cocaine. And of course, the, the, there's a lot of anxiety involved in this too, because I, I could feel there were changes taking place within me, uh, actual chemical changes. And in fact, my blood type changed. The RH factor in my blood type changed between before vampire and after vampire. From what to what? Uh, it, you, I can't remember. I think it used to be O positive, and now it's O negative. And it's, it's still O negative. It's still O negative. Oh. Yes, yes. And then finally, one night, I think I had like 50 lines of cocaine, which is a huge amount of cocaine. And mm -hmm. I was... Would that normally kill someone? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that was sort of where we were going, wasn't it? Right. And as I was doing this, all of a sudden, my master, if you will, the, the, ma the master vampire who initiated me came into the room. And I was totally not expecting it, because this was in our home. We had a chapel in our home, as I said earlier. And he, I wasn't even ready for this. And he says, well, it's time, you know. And he came over and bit me in the neck. And then kind of almost exactly like what's in, the, in some of the movies, he opened up his chest, tore open his chest with his these real long fingernails, talons almost, that he had, and had me come and, and suckle at his chest and drink his blood. And by doing so, and then he said, Certain, just again, kind of like in the Catholic Church when there's, when you're ordained a priest, they place hands on your head and there's certain magical words that are said, and, and then poof, you're a priest. Well, this, as I was doing this, he put his hands on my head and, you know, something happened to me. And at that moment, the, the vampire, if you will, virus, although it's more than a virus, it's both a spiritual thing and a physiological thing was passed into me. And that was when I kind of crossed the line, and at that point I, I could no longer eat, eat food or anything. Because my, my appetite for food was kind of diminishing. Of course, see, cocaine mm. takes away your appetite. The mm -hmm. more coke you snort, the less appetite you have. But that's why some coke addicts look real cadaverous, you know. It's, so anyhow, that was more or less how I made the transition. And, the, and what I want to explain about this is that all of this took place in the context of a very strange, weird branch of the Russian Orthodox Church. And, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of legends and everything. Most of the vampire lore that we are well aware of in, in America and in Hollywood comes from, you know, Eastern Europe, from Russia, from Slovakia, from Wallachia, from Transylvania, Romania, and Hungary. And, and this, this guy who trained me said that there was a special branch of the Russian Orthodox Church that in fact carried this, this secret down through the centuries and it was a sacred trust that went all the way back, believe it or not, to Jesus. And that Jesus created the first vampire when he raised Lazarus from the dead. And by this time, I mean, I mind you, what I was doing is I was in a Catholic seminary at the time. So I, I had just enough knowledge of the Bible to be dangerous and I believed this stuff. 
I thought this was a, a holy thing I was doing. I thought I was going to be, this was a calling and part of what they actually say. They say it in Ugo Valakian, which is the ancient tongue of the Nosferatu, but I was being told that I would be eventually made into an angel of death. And it would be my job to come and be like in a large city, you know, where people die. I would be there at the bedside to absorb their life energy and suck the life out of them and put it into this ring that I wore and then take that energy and transmute it into the cosmos. And this was supposed to be a good thing because without us, no one would die. <laughs> so now then this is what I was being told. Mm. And so it sounded in a weird kind of way sort of noble. But that would only, that final thing would only happen after I finally died, and that would be that would be my second great initiation in vampirism would be to actually die. But that might take a few years. So at that point, I mean, and I'll tell you that was a very very strange experience. You know, drinking blood out of this guy's chest and the energy that was flowing and the power that was flowing. I mean, I nearly passed out from it. But uh, the end result was is that I I. You know, I and, they, and part of the discipline was I had to make a specially designed coffin that had special angles in it according to Megapolis Somancy, special sigils along the side and everything, and it had to be lined with certain fabrics. And it was all it was it was in fact very much designed to be exactly except with, <laughs> without the gold, very much like the Ark of the Covenant or like a Catholic tabernacle, the little box that they mm. put the the hosts in when they're not using them. So, you know, and then finally when I made this transition, then I was, I was asleep. And then the other thing is I had to go at one point before I did this initiation, I had to go to the cemetery of my homeland, which was a small town in which I was raised, and dig up a whole garbage bag full of sacred earth out of that, out of that Catholic cemetery. And again, here's the Catholicism thing. And then I had to line the bottom of my coffin with that sacred earth. Not only that, I had to wear in the bottom of my shoes. I had to have a little, like, kind of a sole thing made that, that I would put some of that sacred earth in the soles of my shoes. So everywhere Very I went, strange. I would have the sacred earth of my homeland in, in, or in and around me. All the time? Mm -hmm. Wasn't that uncomfortable? Hey, you know, you suffer for your life. <laughs> I just, you're obviously a very kind, caring person, and you still wanted to be kind and caring. Yes. How did you feel when they told you you had to go be a psychic vampire and make people on buses tired? Well, at the time, I just, I again, you see, my policy, and I, you're right, I was, I was a very nice vampire in the sense that I would never take too much, under too much blood or too much energy from any one person. I like move around the bus. Or I'd, I'd, I'd go somewhere where there are a lot of people, and, I, and if you, you take like so many things from like 20 people, like I don't know how to quantify this, you know, like so many volts, if you will, from, you take five volts from 20 people, you've got, you know, 100 volts. And all they needed to know is that I was able to do it. It was like a transitional step towards the more serious, you know, disciplines. Did you ever take blood from people unwillingly? Uh, I was getting there fast. Um, the implicit agreement I had with all these women in the covenant were kind of my personal wine cellar was that I would never take too much blood from them. And that was obvious because none of them wanted to die, you know. And a couple times as this progressed, I got to the point that I would, I would drink more blood than the woman could stand and she'd start writhing around and even one passed out, you know, from lack of blood. And fortunately, my wife was trained as, you know, a lot of nursing in her background, and so she was able to kind of help. But uh, I never, that I know of, I had nightmares where I think I might have done stuff, but I don't know it consciously where I might have gone out in the night and I was, I was having fantasies about doing this. Because the only way, I mean, the only job I could have was a third, I had a third shift job putting papers in the boxes for the nighttime newspaper. And so I'd be driving the streets and I'd see the occasional prostitute or the occasional street person wandering down North Avenue in Milwaukee uh, all alone. And I mean, it was, I could, I, my hands were like white knuckling on the steering wheel, you know, of this truck I was in. I was trying to fight, not just going over there and ripping their throats out. Because after a while, even having one tap, if you will, of blood a night wasn't enough. 
You were hungry a lot of the time? Oh, yes. The hunger is the worst part. You're almost always a little hungry. And, and as the day, or as the night progresses, you get more and more hungry. And I would even, sometimes I get so bad, I do two or three masses in one day, in desperation, rather than go out and kill someone, you know. And did they tell you to be hungry before they invited you to become a vampire? No. <laughs> they didn't tell me about a lot of stuff. You know, but I'm, you know, I mean, that's, that's the way, I mean, that's the way the devil works. He never tells you the downside of the things you get into. He just, oh, it's going to be great. All these women will be throwing themselves at you. You'll have all this power because, see, the, the concept is, is that for every person's blood you drink, you permanently get that much stronger. And if you actually drain the entire body of a man or a woman, you get all of their strength permanently. And did you get stronger? I got a little stronger, yeah. But not I, what you promised. No, no. But again, I was, I you know, I was being so fastidious about it. I mean, I probably never drank more than a, a cup of blood from a human being. So that's you know at a time. At a time, right. yeah. So that's not really a lot of blood, and that's not a lot of power. So. Thank you. Now, this story that you. A vampire dies and then rises from the dead. Mm -hmm. Is that true? I, I am frankly rather doubt it, but that's what I was told. And of course, there's no way to tell. I mean, you know, the, like the guy that initiated me, he claimed that he was in fact 150 years old, and uh, he didn't look a day over 40. And did he have a birth certificate to prove that? Or no, right. no. But he, you know, I mean, you know, for all I know, back then, because he was from, he was actually Hungarian. And, you know, maybe they don't even have birth certificates in the Hungary back in, you know, the mm -hmm. end of the 1700s. So, because he said he was born around the turn of the 18th, of the 19th century. Okay. Have you ever heard of murder cases that might have been caused by a vampire? Well, since since getting born again, um, I have I have friends who call me and tell me, like, they've, they've had contact with police officers, especially out west, especially in, in San Francisco and L.A., where where frequently homeless people are turning up with holes in their necks and no blood in their bodies you know and and they keep it quiet because they don't want to cause a panic you know that's that's the usual police because see the police don't have they they think inside of a box and they don't have a they can't you know, vampire you know they, they don't really i mean it, it's not even a crime you know, nowhere on the, unless it's, you know, considered some sort of assault, but there's not like a crime of being a vampire. And I've been told, I haven't seen this myself, but I've been told by police officers that in some parts of L.A. they might have four or five homeless people a night turn up dead, you know, with holes in their necks. And, um, you know, nobody cares, you know, because they're homeless people, and that's, that's why they're being preyed upon. See, vampires are like wolves. They go around and they find the weak sheep that are at the edge of the flock, whether they're homeless people or street people or people that are out late at night, and they're the ones they pick off. And uh, but you see, you've got to raise. Sometimes they don't kill people; they just drain enough blood to get by, and then they, you know, they go on from there. And the person just thinks, "Well, wow, what happened? Why am I laying here unconscious on the street?" But they don't really know because the wounds are so fast healing. Why don't they remember what happened? Because there is a kind of occult power involved, like a almost a screen thing that comes over the whole situation that you don't remember it. Oh, so, so the women that offered to you did they remember? Oh yeah, the because there is there is no real you know coercion involved. But if you supposedly again, I don't know this for a fact, but supposedly if you're a full blown past the grave vampire, you have a large enough wellspring of occult demonic power that you can you know, sort of cause people to forget what has happened after you've assaulted them. So the nighttime really is scary. Well, yeah, it can be. It certainly can be. When your par especially your if you parents don't. tell you there's nothing scary out there, they, it's not totally no, true. No, especially if you don't, you know, have Yeshua HaMoshiach as your Lord and Savior. Yes. Are there women vampires? Oh, well, yeah. It's, it's actually, I think there are actually more females than males. Oh. In fact, one of the scariest women I ever met in my life was a female vampire I met long before I got into it myself. Way back at the beginning of my occult studies, I was at a big conference of occultists and, and adepts in Milwaukee, 
And this lady walked in. It was just this drop dead gorgeous blonde. And she had on like, she was dressing like she was a vampire. I mean, she had like, you know, this real tight black leather dress and this like crocheted cape that was down, you know, it had like bat wings, you know, and all of that and a hood. And, um, and, you know, she just had this, this energy about it. She just drew people to her like a magnet. Very, very charismatic and very physically beautiful. She thought she was about maybe, you know, two or three years older than me, maybe 26 years old. And, and I was kind of like, you know, at that time I was single as long before I met my wife. And, you know, you kind of that age, you know, <laughs> kind of following her around, you know. And this friend of mine who owned the occult bookstore, he said, he says, you don't want to get involved with that woman. Because there was, even then I had a slight ability to see auras, and there was like a darkness around her that was palpable, but it was a very voluptuous darkness. And he said, this lady literally kills like one man a week and drains their blood. He said, she is a full-blown vampire, and you do not want to mess with her. And, uh, you know, not only did she kill men, but she sexually tortured them. Because she, you, you get more of a thrill out of the blood if there's adrenaline in it, it makes it, it gives it a certain bouquet if there's fear. And of course, fear produces adrenaline within the bloodstream. So she would torture men and then drain their blood and kill them. And being beautiful, she had no trouble getting men Attracting men. No, plus she had, it. like I said, it's just, it was almost like being in the presence of a, you know, like a Venus flytrap plant. You were just, if you were a man, you were like drawn like a magnet to this woman. Hmm. So, yeah, there are certainly female vampires, as in many cases, often the female is deadlier than the male. And what would they do with the bodies in a case like that? I really don't want to know. <laughs> okay. I know what I was told later on uh, is that, and I mean, I have no way of knowing, I, I kind of doubt this, but that, but that um, people have, you know, like acid baths and things like that, and they just, you know... And of course, we know there are serial killers out there that, that are not vampires, that are just, I hate to say it, normal serial killers, but that, that they seem to have little trouble getting rid of bodies and, you know, either they cut them up and put them in garbage bags or whatever. I have no idea. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, how does vampirism spread? Well, uh, it spreads like, like any other cult through initiation and also by contagion because... If you are bitten by a vampire, with, if you don't go through all of this other stuff, you still have this, whatever it is, enzyme. I was told it was an enzyme that is put in your bloodstream, and it makes you start to kind of be drawn in that direction. You start liking the things of darkness. You start, I mean, it's very, very subtle, unless you have it done more than once, several times. Uh, it's not anything you'd ever notice, but you just start maybe like all of a sudden you're liking horror movies more. Or maybe all of a sudden you find you're getting more of a taste for raw meat, you know, like cannibal sandwiches or steak tartare or something or other. And it's very, very subtle, but eventually a lot of these people will end up be getting into the goth scene, going to these vampire clubs and so on, and, and they might very well be drawn in to a more serious vampiric relationship. So it, that's, I think, how they get their converts, is they, they, they attack people and a person doesn't even know they've been tapped, so to speak. And then a year or so later, they are drawn into the, into the vampire scene. I see. How many other people did you know who were real vampires? Well, I, I think I'd say there's about three other people I knew that were, you know, supposedly full-blown vampires. And then there was one other guy I knew who was a vampire in training. Okay, and how many vampires do you think there might be in America? In terms of, well, I, I don't know. I mean, first of all, I want to clarify I, that I don't, I have no way of knowing, I don't even know if I believe that these real vampires are actually animated corpses. I don't honestly but think But what about they people, are. people like you? I'll count well, I, I would have no way of knowing. I would guess probably not many. I would think maybe a few thousand in the whole country. But again, this thing has really spread. I mean, when I was into this, None of this goth culture even existed. Now it's very fashionable. It's very, I mean, you can actually find internet sites, you know, First Church of the Vampire or the Vampire Church or whatever. And, and it's between that and the movies and the books and all of that, it's become very, very popular. So it could even be ten times that amount. How did you like being a vampire? 
Well, I would describe it the way I've heard many addicts of many descriptions describe their addiction. I would say it, it's like, you know, two or three minutes of un unbelievable ecstasy followed by 24 hours of absolute hell. And you hadn't got into the full-blown stuff, so that was no, just the beginning. No, because you really, you have this hunger all the time, and then and when you're in this kind of in-between stage, it's both a hunger for normal food and a hunger for blood, and it never really goes away. And that in itself is bad enough, but then towards the end, see, I was just being tormented, wanting to, I started having a bloodlust for I wanted to go out and, and really kill people <laughs> against their will, as if anybody wanted to be killed with their will. Uh, I wanted to tear people's throats out. I wanted to rip people to shreds, literally. And, and it was all I could do, just mainly my love for my wife Sharon and the fact that I knew that if I did something like that, I'd it'd probably ruin our life, ruin our marriage, the same thing of taking a human life. So, but it was, it was awful. It was like being in a, an addict circling the drain and not being able to really get out of it. Yeah. So, and how, did that consume your thoughts? Like, Oh yeah, pretty much. I mean, oddly enough, the only way I was able to deal with it was by writing. I wrote some very awful novels that were like occult novels that were very, very evil, and I kind of used that as a sort of therapeutic way of getting rid of some of my ha-ha-ha demons. But even that wasn't working for a lot. I mean, I knew sooner or later I was well on my way to, to committing a very nasty homicidal act. Right. And then, I mean, even for evil people, they've got to worry about going to jail. Oh, sure. Sure. Okay. Were there other disadvantages to being a vampire? Well, of course, all this happened before the AIDS thing, but I'm sure that would have been an issue. I mean, I think even when I was doing this, there were, there were at that time some people running around with AIDS. It just wasn't, you know, well known yet. But, uh, yeah, not ever be able to go out in the sunlight, not ever to be able to sleep with your wife because you're sleeping in a coffin. <laughs> I mean, you know, you try sleeping in a coffin for a couple of years and see how you like it. I mean, it's not, it's not a lot of fun. And, uh, and yet, you know, I was deceived into this. I was told it would be this, I'd be like a walking god upon the earth. And actually, most of the time, I felt rather miserable. Okay. Were there any other disadvantages to being a vampire? Well, other than the fact that I was probably as lost as a golf ball in a wheat field and going to hell, um, I can't think of any offhand. Okay, thank you. And has it affected you physically in any way since then? Well, yeah. I mean, since, I mean... When I came out of it, I mean, I have now I have a very delicate digestive system. Uh, I still have trouble digesting food. Uh, I still um, have issues with um, things I'd rather not discuss of a personal nature, but, <laughs> you know, in terms of uh, physical problems, physical weaknesses. Um, I mean, really, it, it is, it, 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 to a degree, it ravaged me. And I know that Yeshua is gradually healing me of some of those things, but I'm like, oddly enough, now I have very bad night vision. It's only very recently been getting better again. Um, and of course, there's always this little itch in the corner of your mind to go and drink blood, you know, just like any addict. It's always there kind of in the back of your mind waiting on a street corner, but it doesn't, I mean, it isn't even like even an issue anymore, but, you know, I'm aware of it, but I never do it. Because it's now been, well, it's been, let me think, going on 20 years. So, you know, I'm, <laughs> to use the Alcoholics Anonymous term, I've been clean and sober from vampirism for 20 years. But, but it's an awful thing to have in your memory and an awful thing to have on your back because the imagery, the nightmares, everything, it's, it's horrible. Thank you. Why did you only go out at night time? Well, because really the, the sunlight was very harmful to me. I could... I could, if I wore like long sleeves and gloves and a wide brimmed hat and dark glasses, I could go out in the daylight. But if I ever, I mean, I remember one time I inadvertently exposed like my hand to the sunlight and within like 30 seconds there were blisters on my hand. So, you know, uh, and that's, that's because the, the sunlight just is very detrimental to the physiology of someone who's moving into that realm. Thank you. How do you kill a vampire? Well, I mean, in the, the lore is, I mean, of course, anybody could have killed me. I mean, because I was still a normal, well, a more or less normal human being. But the lore says that you either, you know, have to drive a stake through their heart, 
and then cut off their head and fill their mouth with garlic, which of course will do a pretty good job of killing a normal human being too. Uh, or by fire, if you if you burn them up um, to a crisp, that usually does it. Or if you get them out into the full sunlight and force them to stay there for like a minute or two, they'll usually that the the lore is that will kill them. Uh, but and I could believe it just from what the sunlight felt like to me, because I know if I'd have left it, it literally it was almost like a very very bad sunburn. And if I'd have left my head out there, I probably would have had second degree burns within a minute or two. Wow. So, um, but again, I'm not really sure any of this stuff is true. This is stuff that I've just been told. I don't know any of it by first hand knowledge. Except for what it did to your hands. What it did to my hand, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm.